Welcome this conference will now be recorded. Welcome to the year round table organized by SIDEV and uh, ESN Albania. My name is Valeriana Bino. I am a co founder of the Center uh, Science and Innovation for Development. Um, SIDEV is a um, small, I would say, civil society organization that tries to contribute to the democratic, economic, and the social sustainable development of Albania by working with um, diverse stakeholders from uh, academia, uh, civil society, media, from public and, and private sector as well. Um, together with the Erasmus Student Network Albania, we decided to organize and to host this event on youth engagement in European integration by focusing on digital mobility and online activism. Um, considering the current changes, uh, in the situation of youth, but also broader changes in terms of the um, coronavirus uh, pandemic and the social and economic and public health crisis that comes with it. Also, of course, Albania has wit witnessed uh, another major crisis in the end of 2019 with the earthquake. So uh, this year has been unprecedented. Although we are um, usually uh, used to a political crisis as a normal thing that happens, uh, these uh, crises have affected in a different scale um, youth and many aspects uh, of um, of their lives, but considering our background and our work, today we uh, would like to talk particularly in terms of education, in terms of mobility and activism, and how we can um, uh, capitalize on the potential uh, opportunities that are provided by the um, technology in uh, uh, further empowering the youth to participate in important processes for the development of the country, such as the European integration process. Uh, we are very honored to have here with us today representatives from key institutions working in this uh, regard in the region, in the Western Balkans. So from Regional Cooperation Council, we have Mr. Adem Gashi, uh, team leader of the Western Balkan uh, Youth Project and uh, Youth Lab Project. And uh, we also have uh, uh, Mr. Fatos Mustafa, uh, Deputy General Secretary from the Regional Youth Cooperation Office. And uh, uh, Miss uh, Erida Tsure from the Erasmus Plus uh, National Office in, uh, in Tirana. Initially, we had uh, scheduled for a representative from the European Union delegation in Tirana to participate. Uh, however, we had a cancellation due to unforeseen other uh, more important, I'd say, uh, uh, engagements uh, uh, of the representatives from the EU delegation. Nonetheless, um, uh, I'm sure that uh, Ms. Surai from the Erasmus office will cover a little bit also the topics that we uh, had planned for the EU delegation to cover today in terms of the way forward regarding the Erasmus program and, uh, and youth mobility. We also have with us uh, two um, students, uh, one from the um, Erasmus uh, uh, Student uh, uh, Network International, Mr. Erasmus Benke Aberg, sorry if I'm mispronouncing, and Ms. Silvia Tosco from the European University of Tirana, also a volunteer of the Erasmus Student Network in, um, um, in, in Albania. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to give the floor immediately to Mr. Gashi um, from the Regional Cooperation Council um, to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, IRCC approach regarding youth, uh, the concrete Western Balkans Youth Lab, and their perspective regarding the challenges and the opportunities that this uh, new reality uh, offers for uh, youth in the region and how we can further empower and uh, uh, enable them. Uh, Mr. Gasha, thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bino, uh, for the invitation, and I'm happy to see all of you, I mean, participating in this e-round table. Uh, one of the common things now in during the pandemic times uh, that we are experiencing and we are becoming more used to and hopefully, I mean, more productive uh, by the time. 
So uh, I uh, will talk about uh, how important is youth participation in decision making and how RCC contributes to regional cooperation as well as at national level to advance the role of youth in this aspect. So uh, I wanted to start, I mean, with uh, highlighting how important uh, it is this phase for everybody's life uh, in the sense that during the youth period, I mean, there is this transition that uh, it involves, I mean, also the educational aspect, uh, entering the labor market, but also defining their ways in the lives uh, in, in, in that sense. So it is uh, uh, an important uh, phase also because they become more active citizens. Uh, uh, young people, uh, that is the, the part, I mean, of the life when they become more active citizens and they try to define the role on society. Uh, these are, as, uh, as we started, I mean, also in online, uh, this, this, and we are conducting this in online uh, way, uh, the, the, the roundtable, I mean, uh, it's not something that we are used to. Uh, and uh, we have the pandemic on site. And uh, I want to bring up that two months ago, I wrote an article and uh, I stated that what amazed me the most uh, when the pandemic hit us was the speed, initiative and innovation that young people showed in matter of days uh, after the pandemic. And uh, they were the ones that uh, young people were the ones that adapted quickly to distance learning, found new ways to connect to each other in new circumstances. And instead of retreating or giving into fear, they stepped in to become part of solution. I mean, with solidarity initiatives, production of software applications, as health workers and in many other forms. Uh, so, uh, with the dynamic of changes, I mean, with or without pandemic, uh, those in charge of governance should understand that policies have become living documents, which require f frequent updates and need to be revisited often. Uh, above all, uh, this requires involvement of the final final beneficiaries in designing solutions and uh, policy making cannot be limited only to some technical aspects, uh, but rather has to have genuine involvement of those uh, that will be final beneficiaries in co-designing policies and their implementation. Uh, that's, uh, that's why, I mean, in the beginning of 2020, uh, with the financing from EU, RCC started implementation of the Youth Lab project. Uh, this is a three-year project uh, that will cover the Western Balkan six economies and it's seeking to strengthen formal and informal mechanisms of youth uh, participation in decision making, as well as to provide more opportunities for youth uh, to engage in uh, decision making. This is a, a regional initiative, uh, which is, uh, which is gonna, uh, and gonna have four components. Uh, including the youth policy labs, uh, which uh, are forums where uh, where young people uh, will engage with policymakers in an environment that is considered a safe space for young people to co-design policies and actions on pressing issues for youth, be it on unemployment, on education, on other issues. And uh, jointly then afterwards, they will also translate these into concrete policies at the national level uh, throughout this three year uh, time. Uh, in this uh, format, with this new methodology of co-designing co-production of policies, we will uh, tackle uh, two issues after consultation with the stakeholders in the region. Uh, so for the first one to let you know that uh, there has been wide consensus that unemployment should be one of those topics that youth uh, jointly with policymakers should design policies how to address the issue of unemployment. Uh, with regard to the other components that the project will tackle uh, are include uh, the uh, strengthening of youth councils and umbrella youth organizations in order for them to be able to perform their role vis-a-vis uh, -vis institutions and in representing the interests of the, their membership, uh, which is uh, youth organizations. Uh, the other component includes uh, youth participation at international and uh, regional events. So currently, I mean, we are a bit handicapped in this uh, regard, uh, given that many of the events that we were looking forward or uh, aiming for 
are still uh, not uh, not confirmed to be held in person uh, even for the rest of 2020 so we hope i mean that in the next years i mean there will be more opportunities and better engagement and the other part it is uh, the mapping uh, which is going to include also the component of uh, donor coordination uh, in the regional level that uh, support youth initiative, youth issues, and uh, we are going to see uh, jointly with a number of donors to uh, to see uh, how the, this uh, there could be a more enhanced and better coordination. So uh, there is uh, there is more opportunity for those initiatives in it, initiatives that could lack that lack support to gain uh, such support but as well as to avoid overlapping of initiatives so uh, this is the part i mean that uh, the project is going to cover uh, in all this part as everything else i mean we also had to adapt to the new circumstances to conduct many of our activities online including those consultations that i made about the pressing issue uh, for for the youth uh, with the hope that uh, in future, in the next part of the year, I mean, we will have combined activities of in-person with the uh, online online activities. Uh, but uh, beyond uh, this project, I mean, that the RCC is implementing, uh, RCCB, RCC is involving youth perspective in all its activities, including uh, the latest uh, bulkathon. If you have seen the contest uh, that has been uh, published and uh, and conducted, where uh, many young applicants were among those 88 applications that uh, we have received, and uh, we were so glad to see that many of them have presented such wonderful ideas and developed them into more uh, more advanced concepts uh, on how to address the issues of tourism how to address issues of payments education in the digitalized uh, world uh, so uh, i wanted to in the end uh, to remind uh, to bring up i mean uh, the the case of greta thunberg uh, which is just a reminder, I mean, of how important young people are in setting policy agenda, not uh, of a nation or region, but even at the, at the global scale. And to conclude, uh, we see that the brain drain is major issue and where the feet are taking young people uh, speaks a lot. Uh, they are going to the countries, to the places which have better social cohesion and so uh there is no crystal uh ball i mean to tell the fortune but it's crystal cl clear that if there is appropriate response to youth issues and greater involvement of youth in decision making the region will have a better future better youth education employment policies and uh all uh all looking forward to uh to smoother integration into the european union thanks Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Gashi, or Adem, if I may, uh, to make it less uh, formal. Um, and yes, thank you please. for, <laughs> thank no you for um, highlighting the um, resilience and the flexibility and the innovative potential of, of youth. Uh, we at the side dev had um, an, a small scale similar uh, uh, experience with our project on european uh, integration debate at university level when we had to move online we were under the assumption that student would not be um, so much engaged or committed but on the contrary we found that uh, uh, they showed great initiative as you mentioned and also were very keen to participate in uh, um, in activities that would give voice and would give space for them to express themselves and their uh, point of views and to collaborate with one another and uh, while we are mentioning collaboration and the youth uh, i would like to give the floor to mr fatos mustafa the Deputy General Secretary from the Regional Youth Cooperation Office, RICO. This organization, I believe, has uh, uh, made a, a 
considerable um, impact on youth, not only in Albania, but throughout the region. And uh, um, um, I'm very happy that we have with, uh, with us today, Mr. Mustafa. Uh, back in 2015, uh, some of us here today, uh, with another organization, we were implementing actually a project on digital mobility and youth hacking participation, funded by RICO, and that has been a positive experience uh, bringing together young people from Serbia and from uh, Albania. Of course, at the time, we didn't think that uh, digital mobility would become um, so important considering the crisis, but at the time, it was an instrument used to uh, encourage youth to explore other uh, and alternative ways of working together. Uh, Mr. Mustafa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can call you Bleriana and anyone, feel free to call me Patos. I'm absolutely fine with that. And I think it's it's also not only less formal, but it's also easier to to, to move on. Thank you very Thank much you. for the invitation. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a really pleasure uh, being part of this, if I can call it a discussion of uh, very, very up-to-date challenges that we are uh, facing when it comes to COVID, but also in the same time, how to keep active citizenship of the young people, but not only uh, when it comes to the decision-making process, when it comes to following uh, the, the, the uncertainties, but also in the same time, how to keep life moving. So how to keep the bike uh, moving. So in this case, if we can kind of like say that the uh, EU integration process, it's uh, quite a complex process. Uh, and I remember uh, I was a student uh, more than 15 years ago, and I remember by then we were discussing it, and I had the impression that we are in the most dynamic process of being in the integration process, and I, I would not even think that uh, even 15 years after I will be discussing about the EU integration process. But this does not mean that we have a, such a long process. Yes, indeed, it is a long process, but it's a necessary process to democratize, democratize our system and our societies in terms of how to uh, have, like, let's say, comprehensive uh, democratic uh, transformations in our systems, in our societies, and so on. Let's say one of the steps very lately in the process of, let's say, like reconciliation and, 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 and um, uh, regional cooperation is also uh, RICO itself. RICO is a baby of Berlin process established back in 2016, but being operational only a uh, year after, uh, I think now just uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we celebrated our fourth birthday of establishment, but third birthday of our being, starting being operational. So in the last last three years, let's say, of being operational, we were able to support so far uh, around 100 direct grantee, grantees with uh, benefiting of around 10,000 uh, people uh, with various supporting and, and, and organizing various conferences and activities in the, across the region uh, with, uh, with uh, some of them with uh, smaller, uh, let's say, particip participation of numbers and some of them like even higher participation. So the idea is how to can, we can bring as more as possible. Lately, the COVID uh, system, uh, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, the pandemic somehow uh, impacted not only RICO, I guess impacted everyone, but uh, we in RICO are very much impacted for the fact that RICO is, let's say, a, a, a machine of exchanging people, which COVID is directly attacking the machine of exchanges. So the exchange, uh, meeting people, travel, and all the stuff is absolutely attacked by the COVID, which somehow brought us into a very, very difficult uh, momentum. Not, a, not only us in RICO, but also our grantees, also our uh, uh, our partners, donors, and governments on how to handle the situation uh, on this. We somehow together working uh, jointly with uh, with our partners as well as uh, working with our grantees. We are uh, redesigning, we are reshaping, let's say, some of the uh, of our plans and our activities on how we can adapt to the new to the new circumstances. Lately, we are now, our team is hardly working in uh, kind of like supporting our grantees of third open call of how to redesign and adapt to the new circumstances, as well as we are having the, let's say, the plan A and plan B in case of having COVID, in case of not having COVID in autumn and, and next uh, spring, how to handle the situation in order to not be surprised 
as we somehow been surprised in in in, in especially in, in March and and April, which in any way impacted us even in even if it's impacting even today. So in our fourth open call that we are preparing, uh, we are uh, completely kind of like trying to focus on that the open call is focused as a first option, not physical, but how we can have the creativity of having online or using the the the, the let's say like the digital. Uh, digital tools of how to to uh, kind of like uh, organize exchange programs, reconciliation activities through uh, uh, exchange tools. We are not, let's say, smart enough ourselves to tell them what we should uh, they should do, but we are very much eager to see proposals how they are how they will be creative enough to also challenge us with their brilliant ideas, as we usually are challenged by the organizations, by the schools. On the on the ideas of how to how to uh, overcome different situations, I can say that uh, many times the the uh, the ideas are super brilliant, but now I think it's a really a a uh, a challenge of for everyone of how to, how to come up with uh, this um, let's say new way of dealing with the reconciliations. If somebody would have asked me three years ago that can we do online reconciliation, I would say like come on, that's something that that's the least I would think it's this one, but now it's in our table. It's our let's say like let's say first option to discuss with uh, about, and uh, we are discussing, we are talking, and we are working on on that direction. So let's see. I mean, when it comes, uh, if you ask me, that like, is there possible? Yes, there are a lot of opportunities and possibilities, and I would say like there are also advantages of uh, of uh, having this kind of stuff, but also there are some disadvantages. Uh, somebody would say, like, what could be the advantages? Of for sure, that would be like the quick access on the on the program and projects and, and and activities, easy access to them. So even from home, you can access to these kind of uh, uh, activities. Uh, remote access. So uh, through these, uh, let's say, online uh, platforms, you can even from a very deep area uh, of uh, very rural areas, people can access to these kind of program programs. But as a disadvantage can be a physical distance, which usually it's also impacting the social distance that people somehow got used to. At least in the in our region, people are very much used to uh, physical, uh, let's say, uh, uh, communication, which somehow also impacts the the, the social uh, 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 relationship between the people. And then also is is the 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 uh, the risk of of being uh, young people being marginalized by by various groups uh, through online platforms or online, let's say, even social medias is quite high. We are seeing, especially very lately, a, a, a big debate going uh, going uh, on the, through the uh, social media platforms of uh, who is doing what and who is who is accepting, who is not accepting, with something which is exactly what we are trying to tackle, that's in like the coexistence, co-living and acceptance of each other is the, the, the core principle of, of RIPO and called core principle principle of our of, of what we do of our activities uh, 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 Raiko is let's say kind of like um, uh, is seeing as a, as a quite a critical momentum right now uh, not only the COVID itself but also like the the situation used by 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 various let's say uh, nationalistic approaches uh, from from various uh, sites in the, in the region and I think uh, the nationalism uh, and and um, uh, is somehow is flaming the 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 the, the uh, flaming the the principle of cooperation within within the region. Um, I mean, it's good to see that the many organizations in the region are doing various activities, and I see this uh, very much as a complementarity, not not as a competition between the organizations. And I think uh, the region even uh, needs more this kind of like regional organizations that they, even why not the specific uh, uh, objectives where various uh, areas are uh, well covered, are are, are coordinated in the in the regional level. And also, there is kind of kind of cohesion uh, between between the um, uh, we call them contracting parties or between the societies in the region. Uh, there is no way I don't see any other way that 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 can be on a national level, on a uh, uh, country level, contracting party level, uh, city level. Some of the especially when it comes to the reconciliation, especially when it comes to the exchanges, when it comes to the cultural diversity, when it comes to 
recognition of of uh, of societies between the societies this cannot be done only on the on the local level national level and and uh, also if we call as as uh, adam already mentioned like the uh, and they call as the uh, economies also like for economic development for the employment i really don't see this can be done anymore in the national level adam mentioned the brain brain drain brain drain is not anymore just brain drain of physically like people living physically from from the country uh brain drain today in digital we, uh, world is also like even if we stay in a village in in a very deep area of any of the uh, uh balkan uh, areas but still if it's completely working for a foreign companies is completely contributing foreign companies or foreign institutions and still it's a brain drain because it's a society is not there so it's not receiving the the, the, advantage, the advantage of of the skills and, and 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 knowledge of this of these people so in, in this regard also like this digital world this new digital world has also the other uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages but still this does not mean that we have to be afraid of it we have to really turn even uh, let's say the challenges that we are facing we have to find a way of how to, to turn them into opportunities many people would say that you're like okay so it's easy to say but difficult to do it uh, i think uh, that in order to make it easy to even to do it it can be done only on the regional level and also, uh, uh, also uh, by, by giving a proper space to the young people. We have the slogan, better region starts with the youth. That's something that it's not just a matter of having a slogan for the sake of having it, but for the sake of like really uh, sending the clear message that the region can be done only by involving young people, only by, telling, by asking them how do they see the future. And that's a way because uh, most of the time we are taught to to listen to the uh, to the, I'm now I'm becoming old, and I, I, when I criticize the old approach, I, I start also like criticizing myself. That usually we are we are uh, uh, eager to, to to tell young people that you should be like this, you should look like like this. But I think we are least giving them the opportunity to ask them like how do they see the future, uh, how do they see their 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 uh, contribution, how do they see their let's say uh, their life in 15 years. As I would have been asked 15 years ago, how would I see? I would have seen myself now in Europe, and not even like let's say I come originally coming from Kosovo, and still Kosovo is asking for visa uh, visa free liberalization. So which is like ridiculous. It, in terms of like how I would see 15 years ago, uh, when it comes to the integration and COVID, uh, I think uh, I, why I started this in like 15 years ago, being a student, EU integration process is uh, is a really a never ending story. When I say never-ending story, I don't see, I don't want to uh, to be uh, understood as as criticizing, not at all. But I'm just saying that it's a long process, not only during the integration process, but also even when being part of the EU. Uh, and we know that you know, like um, uh, many of the of the governments in even in the member states, uh, they have the EU affairs uh, uh, ministries or foreign and EU affairs and whatever, uh, for the reason that. Uh, uh, EU integration process is building the boat, but maintaining and sailing the boat requires even more, more afterwards and longer, longer contribution. So in this case, I think young people's contribution, young people's inclusion in the process is tremendously uh, important for the sake of these people to understand the importance of having the EU integration, for understanding the importance of the EU, uh, let's say, uh, body itself as we see uh, a lot of nationalistic approach even like increasing in the eu member states that's that's i think the the kind of uh, uh, the uh, mistake we cannot uh, we are not or we should not repeat in the western balkans of not really having a proper inclusion of the young people of the new generations who has not gone through the the let's say like the suffer that we've gone through during the 90s and uh, early to uh, 2000 so in this case, by involving them, by making them part of the decision-making process, by making them understanding the clear process and advantages and disadvantages of being regional, being European, or being individual, then I think we will suffer even more than, than the, uh, right now the, the uh, European Union is suffering from these uh, nationalistic, nationalistic uh, approaches and increase of, of, uh, of those, uh, let's say, political parties in the, in, in the region. So this is more or less... Uh, 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 from my side. Uh, thank you, Patos. That was very interesting. I particularly appreciate it uh, openly admitting that this is um, a learning process for all. 
Um, so uh, the importance of co-designing program and actions and policy with youth is, is crucial, as mentioned before by uh, Adem as well. But um, I think it is important to uh, echo what you were saying about the risk of marginalization of some groups of youth and to consider the um, uh, digital gap and the division between those who have and those who have not. Um, and to try to avoid as much as possible the uh, talking only to people who are similar to us and creating these eco chambers, but uh, attempting to open up as much as possible to youth who are disadvantaged or who don't have the same opportunities as uh, some other might have. And um, I believe that uh, um, all of us in our organizations as well can uh, make a contribution in, in this regard by uh, creating space and providing uh, access also to, to youth uh, um, who normally don't, uh, don't, 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 have, don't have that. And it, it is also important to uh, involve them and to, um, because it contributes also to this idea of uh, how to reduce the brain drain and how to um, make life and opportunities better for this youth in their own country and to ensure more brain circulation rather than brain drain, as was mentioned before. Um, and now this uh, sends us uh, to the, um, I would say, to the education uh, uh, part and the exchange uh, between uh, youth in different universities in Europe, powerful instrument for their empowerment and their professional academic development. And I would like to give the floor to Erida, uh, representing today the uh, National Erasmus Plus office in Tirana, but also I would like to personally thank her for encouraging us to organize this event and for being open and supportive for different ideas that uh, young people, students and small organizations have and attempting to uh, enable them and to support them in uh, reaching their goals. Um, Erida, the floor is yours, thank you. Please, the microphone, Erida. You see, although we are always in uh, e-meeting, eventually still the, uh, in, when you are so excited, sometimes you even forget this part. <laughs> so um, uh, it is very obvious that I'm very happy to be part of this round table with the main actors on youth uh, EU integration. Uh, I would like to give my sincere thanks to CIDEF Center and uh, ESN Tirana for organizing this e meeting and to bring in focus the process that although we haven't been under, let's say, under normal circumstances, still uh, all of us have uh, continued to work on the process of integration. And today we are again to share our experience, not only among us, but as well between even our kindest audience. Uh, I would like to share that National Erasmus Office in Albania is a training support and monitoring higher education for higher education institutions in Albania by different programs like uh, International Credit Mobility, Capacity Building in Higher Education, Joint Master Mundus, and uh, Jean Monnet. All of them has in focus the EU integration by increasing capacity of students, staff, and policy making through different activities, and one of them is mobility. Uh, National Erasmus Office in Albania um, is uh, also uh, supporting and assisting uh, all the uh, higher education, uh, Albania higher education, Albania to start uh, establish this uh, bilateral agreement. That uh, the the main focus of uh, uh, this bilateral agreement is exchanging through students from one university to another. Uh, students exchange is a very short uh, uh, term studies, three, six, and nine months. Uh, and uh, for staff is less, it's five days, and for the trainership is up to two months. Uh, this institution, as I said, has to build this uh, bilateral agreement between uh, uh, one Albanian uh, higher education institution with another uh, uh, university that is in the uh, program country. Albanian uh, institution, uh, according to the statistics sent by Director General of Education and uh, Culture in Brussels, 
uh, they send us uh, the, the data that they say that Albanian institutions have a success rate of 72 percentage in this application. So this is a very high uh, success rate for Albanian higher education institution, which is the second highest in the Western Balkans country. And I can even bring some uh, data that are very encouraging these uh, mobilities uh, to show that the mobilities are very encouraging the process of EU integration. Only to 2014, 2019, more than 1,600 students has arrived, uh, students and staff has arrived in Albanian institution for exchanging mobility. But on the other hand, more than 3,500 mobilities of students and staff has uh, visited the European University. Uh, every student who is enrolled in one of the higher education institutions institution has to has the right to apply this program. So every student that although we have the audience today and uh, as well when we are uh, encouraging students to apply on these mobilities, uh, it's enough to start the application uh, if they are the students of one of the higher education uh, universities. You can find as well this information in Albanian Erasmus Plus website or in our social media that are uh, daily updated. I would like to share you that during 2020, the National Office uh, of Erasmus Plus in Albania has conducted a survey with Albanian institutions that have active agreements on mobility. So we uh, also uh, 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 interview the International, uh, International Relations Office that they are responsible in each university for the implementation of these agreements and we ask them uh, how many mobilities are in this moment during the pandemic time and it is counted that there are more than 300 students in that uh, during this period of pandemic abroad but only 21 of them has come back in Albania and uh, the questions why they come back to Albania so why they interrupt this mobility uh, you can see that the rate is very small so 21 in 300 uh, students uh, they uh, they uh, replied to us that this is because they are not uh, certain for the future or the uh, government is giving very blue uh, information about the lockdown. But all the other 280 students, almost 280 students, stayed and having this mobility in the host institutions. So, uh, but on the other hand, what happened with the uh, e-learning? Their studies continue just like in Albania in digital form. The students who return as well as those who didn't return attended the lecture in the same way through the online platform from the host institution university. During the, this uh, questionnaire developed uh, with the students, we, uh, I would like to highlight three main uh, results. Uh, so why the students complain about uh, this uh, uh, e-learning? So uh, e-learning was not so fun on the other hand and the students bring three main points. Uh, one, because the long time in front of a computer uh, was very exhausting. On the other hand, not all of them, not all the students have been prepared with computer and internet. And the third one is that uh, the third reason was that lectures, according to the students, were not always prepared of this new form of teaching. So, but during this pandemic period, many good experiences were gained according to these responders. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, the rapid speed of the COVID-19 virus uh, throughout Europe is having substantial impact in higher education as well in Albanian higher education. With almost all institutions, uh, all these activities has been closed, all the activities face-to-face -face has been closed, the doors of university has been closed, and in this case, the online courses started. The COVID-19 shows that there is an urgent need of much deeper cooperation between higher education institutions, uh, um, between uh, researchers and between innovation. Uh, as well, there is a huge need to pull together and share online courses, data, digital and research infrastructure. The COVID-19 has as well accelerated the need for digital transformation of the higher education institution. So in this regard, Erasmus Plus learners could be offered the possibility to start their activity through virtual activities to be confirmed, to be combined as well with the physical mobility abroad later if or if we can start to have situation or if the situation will allow us to have even uh, physical mobility. 
but in terms of recognition, both virtual and physical uh, peers would count uh, towards the recognition of learning outcomes. So already last week we have a meeting about this and we have as well confirmed that the recognition would be both for even virtual and even uh, physical periods of mobility. In case of unforeseen, let's say, COVID-19 situation, still we have a plan B, rendering the physical mobility abroad it could be impossible, but duration of the physical mobility period can be reduced or can be replaced on a station of a virtual, uh, a virtual mobility period. Uh, according to the survey that the agency in Brussels has already conducted in DGAC, uh, during May 2020, uh, to 114 higher education uh, universities in all over Europe, what they say, it was a very encouraging data almost 80 percentage of them uh, shared the good practices and measure uh, the impact of COVID-19 by putting together what e-learning tools and platform so they work in group and they work on exam e-testing e-teaching so they join together the good experience guidance for students guidance for online learning guidance for supporting so all these good experience they share with each other in the other hand the commission presented last week the european skills agenda for sustainable uh, social fairness and uh, resilience so the skills agenda aims to prove the uh, the skills of eu to strength, uh, to sickness between each other, competitiveness, and what is more important, they give us 12 actions how they can be implemented in the skills agenda. One of them is the new, uh, new EU Europass platform that it could be very easily found in the European Commission website. So, as we can see, concrete action are eventually started. Cross European Students Hackathon has started. They have organized uh, how to educate the staff to give uh, training and how uh, to train the online courses, which is the weak point that both Albanian students faced that the teacher were not ready to give lesson online. So now, uh, even this cross European students hackathon has encouraged and has started to uh, increase the capacity of as well staff, trainer, teacher. So uh, now we are ready for the virtual or blended mobility for academic year 2020-2021. So this is a good experience. I'm sure we will extend and we will encourage between higher education institutions. So shifting from class to e-class is just a matter of location, but not the content. We will still keep going through the process of EU integration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erida. Um, it looks like blended learning and blended mobility will be uh, um, certain things, at least in the short term. Um, yesterday, the European Commission reached a very important agreement, but unfortunately, it means that there will be some cut for the uh, research, innovation and education sectors, and we really hope that uh, this will not strongly impact the future program of the Erasmus Plus, because it has proven to be a very very powerful instrument to support the empowerment, the development, as I said, academic and pre uh, professional of youth. Um, now I'd like to give the floor to Lutiona, um, also to thank her for her support and collaboration with the Erasmus Student Network for, the organi for organizing this event today, but also for uh, cooperating with SciDev in supporting young people uh, uh, more broadly. Um, I would invite her to talk to us a little bit about the experience of the network and of the students that they support regarding this uh, shift to digital learning and digital mobility but also how uh, um, Lutiana sees the development for uh, for the future in terms of what has been discussed uh, uh, from the other speakers as well for example in terms of the uh, blended learning and blended mobility. Lutiana the floor is yours thank you. Uh, thank you, Diana. I would also like to thank you and say that for the idea and organizing this and all the participants for uh, joining us and the uh, very interesting inputs that we have heard. Uh, it's very good to see that um, we are in the same side of the story together with RICO, but also other organizations like RCCM and uh, 
this in the at least in the regional area the power giving power to youth is being one of the uh, main topics and i think it's one of the main um, sources for positive uh, changes in the society with regard to uh, as you saw the network in albania we are a relatively young youth organization established since officially since uh, september 2000 um, uh, 19, but it actually we managed to um, uh, apply for uh, be a hosting ESN in Albania for like since three years ago. It, it's a long process. Sometimes I also have compared it with my volunteers, like a process of new integration, because we also had candidate status and, and then final approval. But in terms of uh, Erasmus Student Network International, the organization, as Erasmus will explain later, has been established since uh, uh, the beginning of the Erasmus program in the Netherlands. With regard to changes that we, uh, challenges that we have faced, especially during this academic year, and I would like to contextualize here a bit, is the fact that during the first semester, our international students, uh, they faced the earthquake, which of course uh, the entire country faced as well. And then during this semester, we had the spread of the pandemic. So um, despite this, we have uh, been able, and I'd like to thank you all to the volunteers, which I see uh, some of them are also online, for their ongoing support to international students. ESN is an organization that primarily works on education issues, supporting international students in uh, adapting to the local community, but also supporting the European values through soft skills mainly, such as education and training, and uh, non-formal, um, using usually non-formal tools. During the semesters, we have uh, been able to provide our support uh, online mainly. This has limited the physical interaction, and of course, uh, this limits also the, the physical uh, the sorts of sentiments that you can transfer from uh, physical interaction in terms of also cultural adaptations and uh, international students understanding cultural uh, values in Albania. However, uh, as Arida mentioned, most of those students um, follow their uh, semester online, so even our volunteers and us ourselves had to be uh, in lockdown. So uh, we had during those months a close cooperation with contact points of the embassies in Tirana of those countries because many of the students had uh, troubles with uh, getting back to their countries when they wanted to cancel the mobility and sometimes language was a barrier. So one of the major activities that we had during those uh, months were contact with their embassies at least to, uh, to manage uh, returning them back to their countries. Now, when it comes to EU integration amidst all these pandemics and so on, Albania and North Macedonia managed to have the consensus of the Council of the European Union in accession negotiations, and now we have the new framework of, uh, of negotiations. Uh, and here I would like to stop, and as you mentioned at the beginning, Diana, I'm very sorry to see that none of the EU delegation representatives could make it today, because earlier in 2019, the uh, ambassador Luigi Soreca launched this initiative of having a structured dialogue with youth, and I would have liked this opportunity, but maybe they will see the, the video later, uh, to make this public invitation for the uh, the, the delegation to continue with the structured dialogue with youth actors in order to boost uh, youth participation during this uh, process of uh, EU integration, which is supported by uh, almost all donors operating in Albania and goes in lines with uh, regional cooperation, but also our initiatives. So, as the um, authors mentioned, everything is complementary, and we must give power to youth in order to achieve the results we want through complementary initiatives and uh, integrate Albanian youth in the EU, uh, EU integration process. The Albanian youth, on the other hand, uh, through the Erasmus Plus uh, program has many opportunities to learn more about the practical uh, experiences and practical institutions, but even um, 
uh, daily practices of how a new citizen uh, interacts and how an EU citizen is active uh, either politically or socially through being part of uh, mobilities, either through training, non-formal trainings, but also mobilities or through uh, master programs. In terms of US and Albania, we have also uh, continued our online activity and we tried to contact uh, other actors in order to uh, not be in full um, silence, so to say, during this, these months, because uh, despite the, uh, the pandemic, our international students uh, would feel lonely at the beginning, as it is normal to feel in, in a new country, especially during the uh, pandemic. So we managed to put them in contact also with some uh, uh, therapists and psychologists that were offering uh, free services online. And uh, also for some of the students, they, uh, they wanted to extend their Erasmus mobility. So we are now in contact with universities to understand the bigger picture during the next semester. But as uh, was mentioned before, the situation is very uh, unstable because we are not sure if even the academic year next year will be fully on time or in um, the presence. Uh, a couple of years ago, yeah, virtual mobility was introduced, and I think it is now the moment to promote that aspect of the Erasmus Plus uh, program. And uh, because uh, digitalization might um, uh, might uh, deny us physical interaction, but at least uh, in the sense offers more inclusion to have more uh, youth interaction at European level, but also more inclusion even for citizens or young people who couldn't uh, cope with uh, physical uh, mobility anyhow, like, I don't know, uh, disabled students who have more limited uh, capacities, but also those from countries who have more uh, longer procedures for visa application. So all in all, ES and Albania uh, will continue offering support even during the next academic year. And uh, again, uh, I would like to invite all participants here, but also all stakeholders, like as the EU delegation to continue uh, with joint efforts in, in empowering youth and empowering youth especially as the situation has shown from uh, other backgrounds uh, rather than uh, those of social science uh, we need youth who are more active in uh, research and in uh, this hardcore uh, scientific subject so thank you and i give the floor to you Um, thank you, Mitiona. Um, I would like to um, take the example of SNN to highlight and to echo the idea of uh, how important it is for the youth to support one another. Um, so, as was mentioned initially by Adem, but also uh, uh, as we have seen throughout the uh, outbreak of the pandemic, solidarity is very important, network and support one another. I would say that this is uh, crucial not only in time of crisis, but also under normal, if we could say, circumstances. And it is also uh, one of uh, the goals of actually of empowerment of those who are more empowered to support and to give access and to create opportunities for others. And um, the way I see it, at least in addition to other things that the uh, um, Erasmus Student Network does. I think it is uh, it is important also as an example of uh, solidarity and supporting and networking uh, young people with uh, with one another. Um, and in this uh, light, I would like to now give the floor to Erasmus and then to Silvia to share with us their experience, um, their challenges, and their ideas in uh, in regards to um, how they see the role of uh, of youth and uh, the challenges and opportunities that they see ahead considering the crisis, but also the shift to the digital world. Uh, Rasmus, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you. Can you hear me, everyone? Okay, I see some nods, very good. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's very nice to, to be here and talk about this. Uh, indeed, so I'm from ESN, the Erasmus Student Network. So I work in the Brussels office. And uh, as was mentioned already, ESL Albania is one of our members, one of our uh, newest members, actually. We have 42 members in total, 
So what we did when this pandemic broke out from the Brussels office was that we said, okay, let's look at the situation all over Europe. How, what happened to the students, what happened to the exchange students, to the local students. We, we knew, you know, anecdotally that a lot of classes were shut down, a lot of things were moved online, but there didn't seem to be any numbers on this. So we decided to look into this. So we launched a, a survey that we sent out with the help of all the national agencies, with the European Commission, with a bunch of universities. And uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Is that possible here? I think so. Uh, screen. Share. And here's a very beautiful uh, PowerPoint. Let's see. All right. I hope you can uh, you can uh, see it. Okay. So uh, first thing to mention here is that this is a, a very big survey. I could speak uh, two hours about this uh, about the funding, findings if I wanted to. We found out a lot of things, but I will go uh, quickly through just a couple of key findings that we found uh, particularly interesting, and that has to do maybe a little bit about the overall topic of this webinar about youth helping youth, about student engagement, uh, and so on. Ah, here we go. So uh, the survey was opened from the 19th to the 30th of March. And if you recall, this was in the beginning of the pandemic where things were still very crazy. We didn't really know what was happening. Uh, we got 22,000 responses, which is uh, quite a lot from uh, 125 nationalities. Uh, 99 of them were on exchange in one of the 42 ESN countries. And uh, since we're talking about Albania here, we had 35 students from Albania who replied and three students from somewhere else who were in Albania who replied. Now, these numbers are so small that we didn't do a, a you know, country by country breakdown because it wouldn't really make sense with, uh, with that small number. So I'll focus on the overall numbers uh, instead. But uh, also worth to note here that from the 19th of 30th of March, this means that our survey is you know, a snapshot about what happened right here. We do not claim to know what happened with, you know, with the whole semester, for example. But here's what we found out. So of the students who we, uh, we interviewed, uh, about two thirds of them, they said that their mobility period continued and uh, about a quarter of them, they said that it was canceled. And uh, a bunch of others were unsure of what to do. Perhaps more importantly, during the one and a half week that our survey was open, these uh, numbers changed. So if you look here on the screen, you see the green line. These are the number of students who stayed in their destination. You see this actually goes down as the survey was open. So the longer it was open, the fewer students decided to stay. And, uh, the opposite is the blue line here, the students who returned home. So the longer the survey was open, the more students decided to go home. Now, we believe that if the survey would have been open longer, this blue line would have increased to go up and the green would have increased to go down, which means that more and more students decided to go home, more and more, fewer and fewer students decided to stay. However, this is of course a little bit uh, speculating. We're not 100% uh, sure uh, about that. Now, uh, again, you all know that a lot of, classes were moved online. We have already discussed this a little bit. Uh, only 5% of the students said that the classes continued as normal. I believe that, uh, you know, if we would have kept it open for a few more weeks, they would, this would have been 0%. Uh, but then 34% uh, of the classes uh, moved online or partially online. About half moved to be completely, fully online. And uh, about 10% of them were cancelled completely. Uh, something that we found out very important was uh, what to do with the grants. So you know that the Erasmus students, they benefit from the grant. And this is also worth to note here that not all the students we interviewed were Erasmus students. They were international students or exchange students in Europe at the time of the survey. Uh, they might have been on a bilateral agreement. They might have been national level grants. They might have been other types uh, of grants. But something that we found out was that many students were very worried about what happened to the grants. And uh, especially that there was so much unclearness here. So 13% of the students, they get said they could keep part of the grants. 11% said they could keep uh, all of the grants. 7% said that they had to return the grants completely, but the big majority 
almost two thirds said that they didn't know. And of course, you can imagine that you would be very, very worried if uh, you go abroad, you already have some costs, you pay for accommodation. This is usually paid upfront, quite a lot of money. You might have a flight ticket, you might need to go home and buy a very expensive flight ticket to go back and not knowing whether you would keep the whole grant, whether you would keep nothing of the grant, whether you would keep part of it. This was very, very stressful for many students. So the many students who mentioned that. Uh, now, after the survey closed, the commission updated the guidelines and they said that they should be more flexible with the grant. So we hope that this has uh, been figured out for most uh, uh, of the students. Uh, the students did uh, uh, mention a number of problems. Uh, the biggest ones that they mentioned was uh, uh, the loss of the transportation to go home. They also mentioned uh, access to basic needs, you know, food, sanitary products and so on accommodation was cancelled, or basically all kinds of uh, problems that they could find. But here we come back to the positive part. So of course, this is very negative, what happened to many students. But now that, uh, Ljana, you mentioned this uh, youth support youth, or youth support one another. This is also mentioned by Luciona, that this is uh, something that, that students stepped up and helped each other. Now, we saw all over Europe that a bunch of student networks, not only ESN, but other student networks, they really did step in and they helped the students with you know, delivering food to some students who were in quarantine. They uh, picked up the bags and uh, sent them back to students who had to leave very early. Uh, they organized activities like online activities for students who were locked up at home so they, to make them feel less alone in the new countries and so on. So this was in the, in the very tragic event that happened. We saw some very nice engagement of uh, young people. Uh, again, including ESN, but not only ESN. Uh, yeah, a lot of students, they said they experienced uh, anxiety and stress and uh, the isolation and exclusion. This, uh, uh, this graph here shows how many students felt uh, no anxiety or stress, a little extent, to a moderate extent, and to a great extent. And without going into detail, we can see that a big proportion of students reported that they felt, in one way or another, a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, stress. But let's go to uh, a little bit further down. So we have some recommendations that we did based on this report. And again, I have to emphasize this was just a, a very short uh, summary that I uh, shared a few things now. If you want to read the whole report, Google ESN COVID-19 report, and this is the first thing uh, that you will see. So uh, one of the things that we found is that uh, there needs to be better information and information in the language that the students understand which will presumably be in English. So we found out that a lot of students who were already in a lot of stress, they saw recommendations from the health authorities, from the universities, from uh, someone else, and this was not available in their language. So they didn't understand it. Again, here, some of the student organizations that up and helped out and to translate from their own language to English or to other languages that the students understand, which was uh, very nice to see. Uh, we also recommend that all the International students should have the same available support as for the domestic students. That's not super controversial, but this turned out to not be the case for everyone. Uh, we think it needs to be clear what to do with uh, accommodation. And even if the students, if the universities do not provide accommodation themselves, we argue that they need to, to have information. What are your rights? What, how can you do if accommodation is canceled? What can you, what, how can you deal with this uh, situation? Uh, about the grant, of course, it's very, very important that uh, the funding should be available also for students uh, when the mobility is interrupted. Interrupted. Again, there are a lot of costs that the students have uh, have incurred already when they uh, when they have to leave, and then if they have to pay back all the grants, that would be disastrous for them. Now, so we argue that this needs to be cleared up. Again, we hope that this has been the, the case that most of the students could keep most of the grants. Uh, but uh, we're not really sure about that. And this needs to be studied uh, later somehow. Now, we come to the very important part about uh, online learning. So this has already been discussed by uh, some of the other speakers here in this uh, webinar. So uh, what we argue is that uh, online learning is uh, a good alternative, but it's not great, uh, you know, all, uh, it's absolutely great and uh, nothing else to say about it. Uh, first of all, it needs to be made sure that it's accessible for everyone, as everyone knows. The 
uh, the access to, to good Wi-Fi, to a quiet place where you can study, to good technological tools, all this is not you know, the same all over Europe. There are uh, rich countries and poor countries, and maybe even more importantly, within each country, there are some people who have fantastic Wi-Fi connection, fantastic equipment, a lot of great places to study, and there's a lot of people who don't have that. Now, of course, how to guarantee this is very, very difficult, but this is something that we always need to keep in mind when we talk about online learning. We cannot just say, oh, we move it online, period. Uh, also, in this uh, question, I didn't uh, uh, show you the graph here, but when it comes to the classes that were moved online, a lot of the students, they mentioned very negative comments about it. They said, first, some technological things that, you know, the teachers were not prepared for it. Uh, some students reported, you know, time differences. If you're from you know, Japan and you have to go to J back to Japan and then do the online classes, uh, you might have to do it in the middle of the night. This might not be the very biggest problem, but uh, but still. Uh, but more importantly, a lot of students said that, you know, this is not what an exchange is supposed to be like. You know, I went to another country because I wanted to, to learn the language, to get to know other people, to hang out with them. And of course, this was probably the best that could happen, that they, the classes were moved online because of the health situation, because of the safety situation. We are not arguing that this is uh, was something bad, but we do recommend that uh, as far as possible, uh, the, the physical exchanges should be promoted as much as possible. And online learning used only if there's really no chance to do the physical mobility. Uh, now, the thing that will happen this fall, very likely, as was also mentioned already, is uh, you know that uh, there might be some kind of blended mobility within the Erasmus program. So most students start doing some online learning, maybe in October, maybe November, we'll see how the health situation looks. Maybe it will be possible to go abroad then and do the physical uh, physical mobility during the second half, then maybe do the on online mobility first, something like that, hopefully possible. We, we keep our fingers crossed that this will uh, work. Uh, something in ESN about this also, I think we should be a bit careful about the wording. So right now, all over Europe, many people talk about uh, virtual mobility. We think that we should rather use you know, online classes or virtual exchanges or something like this, and keep the mobility word for when there is a physical mobility involved, including in planet mobility. So we argue that uh, if it's a student doing classes online from another university, we shouldn't really call it virtual mobility because it's not really a mobility. A mobility if when someone travels from one place to another. And again, this is not possible for everyone. And classes can be a great uh, substitute or a complement, the complement, but not really a proper substitute to the online. Uh, to the physical uh, learning. Uh, going further, again, there were uh, a lot of really, really great student initiatives that we saw, including in ESN Albania, but also in a bunch of other countries. Uh, these were gathered in esn.org slash Erasmus at home. If you go check out this hashtag on Twitter or you go to this website, you will see a great deal of very, very nice uh, activities that students did for each other to help the students feel more at home, to make them feel integrated, to do some kind of activities that they would have done normally, but that had to be moved online. And this, I think, in all the misery we saw this uh, spring, this was maybe the nicest thing to see, the thing that made me happy that this, uh, there were so many great uh, initiatives that we saw there. You see a few uh, screenshots about uh, some kind of activities. Uh, it's difficult to explain this in a webinar, so I really uh, encourage you to go and check it out. So again, Erasmus at home, or just uh, check the web uh, the hashtag or uh, Google it, Erasmus at home. Uh, I'm almost at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, when it comes to the recovery strategy, we say that uh, we need to study this uh, further and there need to be proper support structures in place. Again, what we, saw in ESN in this report is a snapshot what happened in March only. If we want to study this further, it needs to be a proper study done, I, I don't know, by the European Commission, maybe by the European Parliament, maybe by someone else, where we see what happened during the whole semester. This we're not really sure, and uh, it's very difficult to take any decision uh, without that. Oh, there's a little bit lag here. This is uh, now I see the, the screen that I was, wanted to share. But uh, look, I can stop sharing my screen now. Uh, why do I do that? Uh, stop sharing screen, voila. Uh, th that's uh, 
that was a short presentation of our study and to see uh, what happened. Again, it was super nice to see uh, all the great initiatives. It was a little bit uh, sad to see so many students having their studies interrupted. Uh, and we hope that in the next semester, in the fall, we will have a little bit more, uh, you know, real mobilities. And I think that's all from uh, my side. Ah, oh, yeah, and thank you, Gianni. So in the chat here, for further information, there is a link to the report. And again, I encourage all of you to actually check out uh, the report because uh, I only so showed you a few of the graphs here, but really not uh, all of it. So that's uh, that's all from uh, my side. I would, of course, be happy to answer questions either now or uh, later. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Erasmus, uh, also for challenging uh, the idea or the concept of uh, digital mobility uh, or virtual mobility. I suppose that with virtual uh, learning and virtual reality becoming a tool for learning, uh, we might find ourselves in the position uh, to redefine the concept actually of, uh, of mobility or most probably we are actually in the process of redefining uh, and reconceptualizing uh, mobility. Uh, before I give the floor to Sylvia, just to mention uh, for the participants, if they have any comments, um, any comments or questions, please you can uh, write them in chat or otherwise uh, after uh, Sylvia's input, we will uh, have uh, some minutes for uh, question and answers or for simply some feedback or some comments from the other participants. So, Silvia Tosco from the European University of Tirana and a volunteer of the Erasmus Student Network in Albania. Welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, thank you for making me part of the discussion. Um, I'm really glad to be part of this kind of uh, discussions because it kind of brings back the memories from my Erasmus. I have to say it was uh, the experience of a lifetime for me because it was the first time for me traveling alone in another country. Um, we Albanians have like um, super protective families and I really wasn't used to doing things on my own. And um, as the first time, like I did it great. <laughs> I'm proud of that. Um, I got the opportunity to go in a one semester Erasmus exchange program in Latvia at the Riga's Technical University. It's not really like um, a country that I would visit, like I would normally go to, that's why I choose that. Like not really choose, I, I was somehow chosen to go there, uh, Letiana knows best. and. Um, I have to say that um, Erasmus is not just about a new university, new subjects, a new approach to studies, to uh, lecturing. It's more because when I think of Erasmus, I think of a new entire life that I will have in one semester or two, it depends on the mobility. But it's a new entire life that you have to adapt to. When I went to Latvia, I really wasn't used to people, to weather, because I come from a very warm country with uh, sunny days and smiling people. There, um, there I found out I went in a rainy day with cloudy and with cloudy weather and people were kind of moody there. I wasn't used to that. And um, but somehow it went good. Um, I adapted to the life there. I also learned a new language. Um, the people were very nice after the grumpy face. They were very nice. And um, I feel like everyone has to like deserves to physically, emotionally and mentally go through that experience. I would agree with the previous speaker that, um, okay, uh, now is the need to go with uh, online courses, but uh, the mobility, it kind of shallows the real meaning of the mobility. Like socializing, it's a bit harder when you go online. It's not that you will have, you will create the same connections with people as you would uh, do it like in person physically. Um, and uh, I, I really feel bad about those who got the chance to go to Erasmus this year and they had to cancel or go through online courses because for sure it solved uh, many safety issues going online, but uh, somehow it shallows the real meaning of the mobility. And um, 
yeah i really hope they will get the chance like to to do it later in the real form of it because now um I can say I'm going worldwide with friends. I have friends from almost every continent in in this planet. So, and it feels great actually to to have so many friends, meeting so many cultures. Um, I would never ever think about having friends from from Hong Kong, from uh, Colombia. It's it's very exotic. Latvia was also people would laugh when I when I said Latvia was exotic for me because uh, you know uh, Latvia is so in north and um, nothing exotic about north. But uh, that's how it felt about me for everything that was different there. Uh, when you go to a country that you know nothing about, it's uh, I feel like it's exotic for me. And I also learned Latvian, which was very hard. And um, I, I still remember the words that I used more often. It was hello, goodbye, thank you, and chicken. Because when I would go to supermarkets, that's, that's everything I had to say. And um, I met um, a new, uh, they had a new approach of um, the way how they would manage um, student networks in in Latvia was different. The ESN in Latvia is kind of different with ESN in Albania. And um, we didn't have like uh, the opportunity this year to give our our experience to the new students uh, because I was very like uh, ready to to give them like new activities and things. But I'm really um, yeah, it's it's sad that they didn't have the chance to to enjoy Albania. And for Albanian students and other who were expecting to go in a new country, it's really sad they they couldn't. And I really, uh, I really agree to the previous speaker because yes, I know online is great, but um, I feel like um, if uh, there is no like uh, conditions, the good conditions to go with the mobility, uh, I think better postpone it than uh, just go online. They would miss like a lot of experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking just from the experience side. So yeah, I'm not really into the procedures, but um, from the experience, like I think um, we should like promote the real mobility more. That's all I had to say. I wanted to be short because I know you are, you're probably all tired. I just wanted to say the good things, the fun part. Thank you, Sylvia, for sharing your experience with us. And uh, for in this case uh, uh, arguing for the importance of actual and physical uh, mobility in breaking stereotypes and in bringing people closer to one another uh, by understanding much better their uh, uh, cultural and social traditions and by cohabitation and co-working and co-learning um, uh, it brings us closer and of course it helps to to, to counter stereotypes and uh, and any potential uh, discrimination um, so before we say a couple of uh, concluding remarks and uh, I would like to open the floor for all the participants who are still with us um, if they have any comments or questions uh, for our speakers or any feedback or experience that they would like to share uh, you are more than welcome uh, of course, this uh, E-Roundtable e-meeting is being recorded. We will publish it on our website and social media as well. We will try to do um, 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 an overview uh, article or a post with the key messages that uh, were uh, um, shared here today. And we consider this uh, together with ESN as a uh, uh, a platform that could be further developed, uh, an opportunity to um, get together again and to discuss again uh, the challenges, the um, achievements, but also the, the entire process. Um, so let me give the floor to Adem. He would like to add something. Yes, of course, Adem, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bledyana. I just wanted to uh, say uh, Thank you a lot to Sylvia for bringing up this uh, personal experience because this is by the end uh, what it matters. I mean, all the work that all the organizations are doing, it matters that the activities and the uh, everything, it's, 
it makes sense and it contributes i mean to the youth and uh, and uh, how they see i mean how they benefit from from all this experience so uh please never say sorry for sharing such uh, such experience and uh, all uh, especially in these events that uh are uh, particularly focusing on youth so thanks thank you Adam. anyone else um, can i just sure. a short thank you Blariana. this is orchidea sorry for not being able to be um, let's say with a face in front of a camera. Uh, thanks, Liliana, for, for organizing this event. I think it's, um, as, as it has been, let's say, um, emphasized by all the panelists and participants, it's very important in this time. And, um, well, um, let's say I would like to encourage or maybe open a discussion later on regarding, as has already been mentioned, the, the need for digital mobility and uh, the benefits of digital, digital mobility that even though it doesn't substitute physical, let's say, presence in other countries, it's an excellent tool to allow people to travel uh, digitally in each other places and especially for youth for exchanging best practices and for encouraging and providing advice and providing um, um, support in drafting or approaching policymakers. As Adem mentioned in the, um, in the beginning, it's about uh, policies are living documents. They have to change all the time. And I think that the youth has to make more um, use and to take more availability of the present tools at hand to use them in advocating for their rights and to use in advocating and impacting, impacting policy. Now with social media and all these other new media developments, I think it's time, time for them. Again, thanks a lot for this interesting um, discussion and we're looking forward to, other, to others in the future. Thank you, Orchidea. Much appreciated. All right, if uh, no one else would like to add something, I would like to... Diana, Diana may I say something? This is Anila. Uh, yes. You might wonder why Anila from Paris, which actually uh, never has been in Erasmus, but I have experienced what Silva actually shared with us many years ago. Uh, I studied in Norway, actually, so it's kind of like I agree with her that being physically and meeting so many people and so many countries is a huge experience. I uh, want to felicitate actually all of you that organize this kind of uh, sessions. I saw this uh, uh, notification in, uh, in Facebook. Uh, I live in Paris uh, and work in telecom, but I'm very much involved in uh, community here and particularly we have started the network uh, student network here so i try to share with as many students and even the network so they could participate on that and i'm very much involved also in the diaspora so that is something that to, in an, in a future sessions we could involve also other people from diaspora to contribute because there's not only students about um, we have in Europe and in uh, in all over the world, but we have so many students that has now become like experts and they can give like other. So when you mentioned that you want to develop further this platform, it's a very good idea and, uh, and feel free actually. I am a member of uh, National Coordination, uh, Coordination Council of Diaspora that was, uh, that started last year. So feel free to contact me, that's why I, uh, put my name and uh, if we can do some joint session as well, it would be uh, much appreciated, particularly with the uh, intention that how the young generation that should be focused in our countries uh, to be like uh, the main, how to say, um, force to, to, to uh, not only be an um, indicator to in, in the country so they will be make the changes but also in, to enter it in you there will be like those young generation who studies abroad they can bring a lot in countries and how they can be more involved that would be very important because this is one of the major um, uh, concerns we have is that that the the, the power of uh, of the the, uh, the power of or, or the voice of the young generation 
it's almost not heard in Albania. I mean, you, there are so many organizations, I do agree, and I don't know, I don't remember who mentioned that, that there are many. I hope that you find the synergy because there is no point to everybody makes their own platforms, everybody makes their own program in their own uh, directions, uh, instead of just getting all together and uh, profit from others' experience. So thank you very much. Thank and you, Anita. Keep going. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your input and also for highlighting the importance of diaspora. Um, one of the things that we try to do at SciDev, of course, is at a very small scale and that we've done before with the support of the Swiss Development Corporation is the engagement of the academic diaspora, Albanian academic diaspora in Albanian higher education research sector. Um, the idea behind that was that, of course, we cannot uh, um, make uh, Albanian successful uh, professionals return forever to live and work in Albania, but we can. what we can do is um, support and encourage brain circulation, as we mentioned before, for them to work and cooperate with their peers in Albanian uh, universities, and this is something that we intend to, to also uh, do in the future. So, um, I mentioned only the academic, but as you said, the diaspora in a broader sense is very important, and thank you for bringing that in. And also I uh, echo again and I, uh, I strongly agree with you and with what Fatos had said before about the need for coordination and synergy between uh, uh, initiatives and programs and uh, this is uh, one of the reasons why we never do things alone but we always try to cooperate with other organizations and other persons that share the same uh, mission and the same philosophy uh, uh, as we do. Um, I think Lutiana as well wanted to add something. Lutiana, the floor is yours and then Fatos okay sorry I said uh, to Luciana first in the chat thank you Fatos uh, most of my final intervention was covered by Anilia so thank you for that but again as one of the co-organizers I would like to thank everyone and again uh, just extend uh, the invitation to continue with this platform and we can later also include uh, other actors. What uh, my personal reflection is that what this COVID experience showed us is uh, the way we organize events dedicated to young people. So I look forward to having a more normal situation and uh, we are open to propose new formats of organizing activities for youth and not just physical roundtables and conferences as it has been now the classical approach. So maybe young people, uh, we should ask them also on how uh, they want to organize activities, maybe more outdoors or enjoy more of uh, the pleasures and possibilities that we have just being uh, rather than being closed in, in conference rooms. So again, uh, now we can make use of digitalization and we will of course in the future make use of it. It's a part of the human uh, future. But uh, when it comes to youth activities, um, we can use digital tools, but also combine it with a more interactive formats of organizing events so we are open to that thank you Saiden and yes thank you Thank you, Lutiana, also for your collaboration for making this event possible. Uh, Fatos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Liliana. I just if I may just uh, add on top of uh, kind of like uh, uh, a comment over the Silvia's uh, Tosco. Thank, thanks a lot, Silvia, for sharing your your uh, uh, case and, and your experience, which actually that's something that is actually concerning everyone, like how we can turn this uh, or can we make such an experience also like through virtual uh, uh, methods and tools. Which I think I don't I, I don't really see completely as as dark. Uh, I think that's unexplored, and only the 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 practice and the reality will 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 tell us you know, like what is like really the the the, the let's say like the final thing. I, personally, I would like also to, to see people physically to exchange and so on. But I think it's also the time to 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 be smart enough or to find a smart way of how we can um, let's say kind of like at least for the beginning. In, instead of exchanging people to share, uh, even virtually through these methods and tools, to share the 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 advantage, the, uh, the, the, the 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 let's say like the challenges, to share the opportunities, 
and and then to exchange ideas of how to overcome all of this and how to to use this smartly and uh, have a more inclusive process so at least these uh, technology stuff can um, uh, or or provides us the opportunity to have more inclusive process in the in the process at the beginning we are not used to this and i think sometimes it's getting bored of being like two hours in front of camera and at the beginning i remember in march i mean even before we were having uh, online meetings and so on but like being full day in front of camera i started thinking like am i talking to myself or to whom i'm talking so i mean this kind of stuff we are just to be patient and see by end of uh, i guess by end of, of august we plan to have to launch the fourth open call and i kindly invite any of you who are, who are active in ngo sector uh, dealing with youth and also like being creative enough and come and challenge us with your ideas on how to smartly use the virtual world in, 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 in the reconciliation process and exchange progress. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fatos. So um, I guess we are also right on time, maybe running a little bit late. Um, thank you again, uh, personally, and also on behalf of, the, of SciDev and of uh, ESN Albania for participating today and for sharing very openly and very honestly your ideas and your perspectives uh, with us for this important topic. Uh, as I said, we will try to um, do some follow-up with uh, uh, this network and with the key ideas that we discussed today in terms of the um, importance of resilience and flexibility and innovation of, of youth, uh, but also regarding the, the idea that was uh, mentioned almost by all our speakers of co-designing uh, programs, actions and policies for youth uh, by, of course, considering youth in their own agency and uh, um, empowering them and providing them spaces to participate and to voice their concerns, but also their solutions and their ideas for uh, for the future. I think it is uh, very important to highlight the issue of uh, uh, trying to be wary of uh, further deepening the digital divide or marginalizing those uh, groups who are already the margin of society, also within youth. Um, and uh, to stress uh, an important point that was uh, uh, mentioned also by Rita regarding the need for capacity development, uh, not only for youth, but also for uh, um, universities or even organizations working with youth. As Patos mentioned, this is a learning process for all of us. Things are changing very fast, and uh, this is why it is uh, important to work together, to uh, coordinate and to network in order to better adapt and cope with this, this process. Um, also, so echoing what um, the RCC is doing and what Adem mentioned regarding uh, youth's employability as one of the most important uh, uh, tools for uh, for their empowerment and encouraging to continue and urging the European Union and also other uh, uh, key players in the region and in Europe and in Albania to continue what Utiana mentioned as a structural dialogue with youth for uh, the European integration process but also for other important and uh, policy changes and development process that are going on in the country. And um, um, finally, to um, highlight what uh, Orchidea, Anila, and uh, uh, the others shared regarding the fact that the youth need to take initiative and uh, to make use of the tools that are at their disposal of the platforms to be um, proactive and uh, to um, exert their rights and uh, um, also contribute to their uh, community and to, to the country as well. Thank you to Rasmus and to Silvia for sharing their uh, experiences um, with the mobility um, and with their education uh, in Europe and the work with other students that they are doing. Thank you once again, Adem, Fatos, uh, Erida and Lutiona for your interesting uh, uh, presentations and insights today. I'm sorry if I'm forgetting anyone. I'm really grateful for uh, this uh, time together uh, today and uh, we will follow up with SciDev and SN ESN Albania and we hope that we will have other opportunities to meet together, to collaborate together. Um, we do things um, out of passion and commitment and not because we have, I don't know, some uh, 
uh, obligation to a donor for some project activities. We might do that as well, but in most of the cases since the pandemic broke out, we have done things out of passion and commitment and uh, um, the idea of supporting as much as possible other uh, uh, others and particularly youth or, or women or students or researchers or civil society organization so thank you again and i hope you enjoy the rest of the day and hopefully the things will get better uh, for uh, uh, for youth for the entire region and we will uh, uh, successfully overcome the challenges posed to us by the crisis thank you again thank you Liliana. thank you bye Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. See Thank you, you next time. Thank you, Annie. Bye-bye.